continuing with the typical simulation pitfalls, we are going to go into the details of each. To begin with, let's look at the inappropriate levels of details that we either pass or deny for the simulation implementation. It is important to include all the details in the model which are relevant. An overly stated model, that is, a model that gives lots of input parameters to the simulator, could make the system so heavy in terms of computations that it may become infeasible. If we include a lot of parameters, these parameters would have a correlated effect and could actually make the interaction so complex that the simulation output becomes useless. More so, their interaction could actually become very difficult to determine. Sometimes it becomes very hard to know if there are more than, let's say, 50 parameters. What is the relationship of, say, more than 10 parameters with each other? Maybe it is trivial. Maybe it is non-trivial. So the thumb rule is, always include what is necessary and do not miss out on what has to be sufficient simulation. If you want to visualize it in terms of a simulation of one hop communication scenario, there are so many things that we just obviated when we looked at the modeled inputs and the simulated outputs. What were those? We never considered what is the operating system, iOS, working on the router or the access point. Similarly, we didn't consider what were the machines. Were these i3s, i5s, IBM machines or Dell computers? Why? Because the types of uh, uh, platforms and the operating systems are supposedly irrelevant to the one-hop communication scenario that you wanted to simulate. The choice of the programming language is really critical to the success of a simulation. For example, the two well-known classifications of programming languages, which is procedural language and object-oriented language, each have different implications on the simulations that you wish to perform. The procedural language is limited in terms of encoding and implementing the data structures and the conditions within the main body. Similarly, if there is a requirement to include certain libraries from the outside, in procedural language, this may have a toll on the overall time complexity of the programs. So generally we switch over to the object-oriented programming paradigm. The object-oriented pro programming paradigm encourages modularity. So for one hop, one hop communication scenario, depending upon the kind of inputs and outputs you wish to choose, you can either opt for a procedural language or you could go for an object-oriented implementation. For a tangible and purposeful simulation, I actually recommend, and we shall see shortly, use object-oriented simulation environments. Another classification that exists is on the basis of the kind of program compilation or interpretation you wish to perform. The compiled languages have their own effect on the simulation because unless the program is fully compiled, 
you can't see the behavior. On the contrary, the interpreted languages can actually show you while you build your simulation the expected or behave, uh, likely outcome. Here is the catch. The catch is, if you really want to implement the simulation for long-term runs, it is better to perform one-time compilation and look at the results towards the end. Whereas, if you want to perform the simulation, get back, do some modifications, redo the simulation implementation, and get the results, a to-and-fro kind of behavior necessitates that you stay in the interpreter world. But since in interpreted language, there is more software depth that is the um, machine uh, the machine code or the byte code and the uh, um, virtual environment that you are running, sometimes it becomes unfeasible to run the simulation. Another common mistake that many implementers of simulations do is that without verifying the model, they just rush to implement the simulation. It is important to consider that programming is a non-trivial task. Once programming is undertaken, it is only programming which is done. No further hopping or reversal could be done in terms of changes. So if there is a semantic mistake which somehow stayed within your model and just got away, it could result into absolutely wrong simulation result. Just to correlate, if you are looking at one hop communication scenario, there, since the wireless computers and the access point are directly visible to each other. So adopting non-line-of-sight model could have serious implications because it would give impractical results which, are, which cannot be tallied with the real-world data collection. So in order to verify, it is important to go step-by-step step to verify that each module is correctly similar to be simulated. Another important consideration is many people just take the initial conditions for granted. It is important to note that these are the initial conditions which determine the steady state. So, if the steady state is to be realized, the initial conditions will have to be correctly passed. And the system will take its due time to implement or to reach to the steady state. Surprisingly, some people argue that the system must converge or must reach the steady state with the initial conditions given. So, it is important to understand that these input parameters that you give could have an effect on the a time it takes for the system to enter the steady state. If the simulation is run for a very short time, it means that the system is highly influenced by the initial conditions just given to it. And the simulation was not given enough time to reach the steady state. 